Hi everyone, it's Ren here, hope you're doing well. Um, I want to welcome you to this video and to my room by the same token. Um, today, in this late, late afternoon, in fact it is almost half six, it's quite a miracle that uh, my face is still visible. Uh, you can really tell that it will be the onset of spring uh, very shortly. Um, I want to say also that this time we have a special guest. Uh, <laughs> you see what's happening there? What is she? She's hesitating. She wants to go. Oh no, no, she's going. Oh my god. I ha had used this like t-shirt as a bait. She loves to like Ned in the t-shirt. Oh my god. What a reputation. Like this reputation is awful. <laughs> it's like I'm a bad brother. I mean if she's taken to be my sister, which she's family, right? Why is she always escaping whenever I'm making a video? My reputation is ruined. I'm telling you. Anyway, better fix that. And I probably will let her out. The real reason is I think she's wanted to um, be let out for a while. So, okay. Uh, so that was a, a minor incident. Sorry about that. No, in fact, in this video, I really don't want to talk about uh, anything to do with, with, with cats or felines in general, or, or you know, any, uh, any um, such mammals, really. Uh, my objective today is to have an informal discussion on the question of, uh, of Soren Kierkegaard's uh, MBTI type. If we want to have a bit of fun with the typing of philosophers, um, <clears throat> I think Soren Kierkegaard is, 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 uh, is an apt choice. Particularly from the perspective of IN people, IN types, I mean, <clears throat> but not only. Because it is almost certain that Kierkegaard was an IN type. <clears throat> uh, however, it is usually a matter of debate uh, whether Kierkegaard uh, was an IN FP, uh, which is, I think, tends to be the dominant view. Um, Versus INFJ, which is, is uh, I would say, the, the dominated view, it's, it's not dominant, um, but it's nevertheless quite present. And there, if you check on forums, that is, if you're a nerd to the extent that you go on Google and type uh, philosopher name, any philosopher plus MBTI, which is <laughs> something I do at least once a week because you know my life is is, is well you could call it sad or call it delightful. Um, but um, let's just say that you know um, it will quickly appear that the, the the faction defending the idea that Kierkegaard is an INFJ rather than INFP is quite um, is quite sizable, and that in itself is interesting because um, <clears throat> I had started. Uh, from the point of view, and I, it's a po point of view that I held for a while, uh, uh, and that I have changed since then, uh, thinking that Kierkegaard was an INFP. Um, but I am now, I had just had this aha moment, you know, how cliche for an INFJ. I had this aha moment earlier, thinking, no, but it's, he's an INFJ, it's okay, I've decided, I've decided, he's an INFJ. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> I, I, would, I would like to try to give a little bit of meat to this argument, to try to convince you guys, or to not convince you, because at the end of the day, you will, um, you know, you will keep your own opinion uh, to yourself, but um, to at least offer, I don't know if I want to call it an argument, because as you can see, I, I'm, I'm adopting a very informal style, which I, I, I favor these days, because I find it more natural. So it's not like I have written something beforehand um, I'm just going to offer some thoughts and, 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 and some, some maybe I would maybe more advise to call these sketches of arguments towards the INFJ-ness of Kierkegaard over his supposed INFP status. Um, so that's an interesting one. So maybe let's start by trying to have a quick look at the arguments, uh, you know, a scan of what is the substance of the arguments usually propounded um, in favor of, of Kierkegaard being INFP? Again, the slightly dominant view, I believe. You know, even if you go on IDR Labs, 
you'll you'll see him listed on on uh, INFP famous INFPs. That in itself probably has quite a lot of influence over people's opinion and preconceptions. Uh, you know, probably biases people a little bit towards seeing him as an INFP. But it's true that on the surface you might think, well, Kierkegaard is an INFP, uh, and and this this belongs to the substance of the arguments that I've been able to explore online. Okay, so uh, what what are the arguments? that I have discovered, uh, or rather rehearsed, you know, uh, to the extent that Kierkegaard is, a, is an INFP. So, uh, IN, uh, that's pretty much non-controversial as far as I'm concerned. Um, he clearly seems to have been an introvert, you know. Uh, you read a bit about his life, he's, he was uh, not, not the most social person, uh, albeit not the least social, you know, but... Um, and a uh, very abstract thinker, you know. Kierkegaard is not uh, an easy an, an easy person to read. A lot of people relate to his works because, although he's not always easy to read, his passion about the human condition is, is really um, it, it breathes through his writings, which is a welcome change from a lot of uh, somewhat dry philosophies. You can have philosophers who are extremely brilliant and who are extremely intelligent. Uh, and who have very good ideas, but whose style is like the style of a pro professor uh, rather than that of a, of a human being. And, and Kierkegaard, I think, is very different. His style is a little pompous, you could argue, at least some people might think that, but it is so passionate, it's, imp it's impossible not to be enthralled by, by the intensity of his writing, at least. And he is really, really interested in the human condition and in, in the human individual. Um, and I think this is this is part of why people tend to see him as a, as a, as, a, as an INFP. Um, it is because one of the reasons is that his topic of interest is is the human individual. It's the individual, and so people think, okay, individual, therefore not universal, therefore FIUs. Uh, so if we see him as an introvert, abstract thinker who uses FI, right? Uh, there's only INTJ and IN, uh, yeah, FP that are left. Um, INTJ, I think, is relatively easy to to dispose of in the case of Kierkegaard, because uh, he just really strikes one as a feeler type uh, a lot. I mean, quite quite quickly, uh, I think, in his writings, talks about a lot. A lot of his writings, it's not just about um, the importance of human emotions and states of feeling, but he himself, if you read about his life, if you read about descriptions of him, and if you read about his, you know, if you read a lot of his works, you sense a, a very acute sensitivity that is not just the sensitivity of a sensitive T-type. It is really the sensitivity of a feeler, I think. Uh, and it, it doesn't seem to be very controversial to see that. I mean, and also, if you wanted to make a slightly more uh, technical argument, I guess, you could say, just say, well, he doesn't use any TE. He doesn't really seem to use any TE. Um, or he doesn't use TE to the extent that it is something that is quite visible in his writings, you know. Um, so maybe that can be allowed to rule out INTJ. That being said, that being said, if he's a feeler type, that is an introverted intuitive, uh, yeah. Then, as in introverted and an intuitive, then you know the question is: Is he INFJ and I or INFP? So, like I said just a little bit earlier, one of the arguments is that Kierkegaard is a P-type because his, uh, his philosophy is an FI philosophy, a philosophy of the individual. Uh, another argument that is often uh, mentioned, I think, for him being an INFP is that he seems very INFP. He seems to have had a very INFP life and a very INFP uh, appearance, long hair, not, not really well like arranged, you know, kind of kind of wild hair, and the, if you look at certain portraits of him, you know, he will strike you more as as a. He looks like almost like a, a typical sort of romantic poet of, of the nineteenth century, and of course these are often associated with INFPs, although they are not all INFPs, of course, most of them probably are. But uh, so Kierkegaard just has that that image, uh, and on top of that comes his biography as. Um, in relationship to his love for, for Regine Olsen, I think was her name, and how he just had a very tortured interpretation of what that love, what that love 
might be and what its meaning might be and it's his like you know the i think you know he renounced the engagements with continued thinking about her and justified that renouncement in some transcendental sense and, and people a lot of the time people think about that as extremely fi driven and and in fact quite reminiscent of, of the way that proust talks about uh, romantic relationships in in search of lost time and proust to me seems quite clearly like an infp so is there some is there fi going on in kierkegaard's at least in his life there seems to be and the diary of the seducer the, one of the chapters from from his book either or that is largely inspired by, by his story with regine olsen uh, does seems does seem to exhibit a character that uses fi that being said that being said so how, what can we say about these different arguments well you know um i guess the first one that comes to mind for the INFP Kierkegaard is that um, he looks like an INFP, he dresses like one, he seems to have had a life. To me, that's, if you like, it is an argument that what people can hear quickly, people can identify quickly, and maybe be persuaded by quickly also for these reasons if people are not willing to scrutinize the argument further. But the thing is, there are lots of, there are lots of, um, of people who are of a certain type that do not really look like the embodiments of that type. You know, like um, there are INTPs uh, that will look very clean and and not that they look dirty, but like often we think of INTPs as having like crazy hair and these things. I mean, okay, Einstein kind of suits that, but if you think about, I mean, I was gonna say Kurt Gödel. I don't know if you know Kurt Gödel. Uh, a logician, but he looked like an INTJ, and he's he definitely is, is an INTP. And um, there are other examples, INTJs. There there are INTJs with long hair. I mean, that's possible. So I don't I don't think that that the the argument about uh, Kierkegaard's appearance is sufficient to classify as an INFP. Uh, as regards his, I, mean, I think the more interesting argument here. I mean, the bio the biographical detail to me. <clears throat> is again a little bit superficial because we don't really know the detail of how the relationship with this Regine Olsen person unfolded. You know, from, from a distance, it might seem like an FI. Could, there could be FI, but that doesn't mean that FI is all that there is to uh, to the, the relationship. You know, and, and and perhaps we don't know it that well. Now, it is. It, it inspired this this. Um, it inspired this text diary of a seducer. It's true. Which brings us to this argument that F.I. dominates Kierkegaard's philosophy because his philosophy is a philosophy of the individual and the affirmation of individuality. The thing is, a friend once said, do not confuse the, the typology or the type of, um, of, a, of a philosopher or a thinker with the type that we would associate with the content of what he writes. So... You could write a philosophy of the individual in a totally F-y way. You could write, you know, you could be an INFJ or you can be an ESFJ or whatever and write a philosophy of the individual. Like to identify the type of a philosopher through his writings, what you need to focus on principally is, is not what he talks about. Of course, the, ty the, the type that you're going to have, the type that you have is going to influence what you want to talk about, so, you know, but not completely. The existentialism is often, a, um, uh, you know, it's often a movement that is associated with, with FI. But Dostoevsky is an existential uh, writer. In a way, he was one of the very first existentialists. And, you know, he massively influenced Nietzsche. And uh, he was an FE user. He's an INFJ. At least that's the pretty much accepted conception of Dostoevsky. And in the case of Kierkegaard, I think we have to think in the same way. Uh, he... He's, you know, he's one of the fathers of existentialism. He writes about the individual and he writes about the experience of the individual as the fundament of the essence of the individual. So the existence coming before essence and defining the essence of the individual. Um, but that's the what. What is the how? You know, I think the, the, the how, how does he deal with it? How does the person called Kierkegaard go about writing his text, presenting his argument that seems, in terms of the whatness of it, to have an FI ring? Um, well, I think he uses a great deal of NI and TI, <laughs> and that his use of SI is non existent, um, and his use of NE is pretty much non existent as well. 
uh, he seems to have this this idea. Like Kierkegaard has this idea, and the idea that Kierkegaard has is 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 one that is is an NI insight. I'm sorry, but it has to be. The NI insight that Kierkegaard has is that is that faith faith is the highest. I mean, if I had to simplify, you know, I had to simplify uh, Kierkegaard's thought is that faith is the highest level of freedom that an individual can achieve. Which is why he's called a Christian existentialist. So because he based his existentialism in, 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 in religion, in faith, to a certain extent. Not, not the entirety of, of his uh, philosophy is oriented, is geared towards religion. Um, you could totally have an atheistic understanding of Kierkegaard, which, which in a way is what Sartre did, he, what he achieved. Um, but if you follow Kierkegaard's scheme, the whole idea of Kierkegaard is that faith links the individual to the universal. He says that explicitly in either or. Faith links the individual to the universal by surrendering oneself to a force beyond oneself. Which is God, and he uses the example of of of, of uh, Abraham. Oh, someone's back. <laughs> well, uh, I hope maybe she will say hi to us. Hey, Hazel. I know what she wants. She wants to go outside, and I'm going to let her go outside. But maybe maybe I can I can introduce her to you again if you're interested in my cat. She's an existential cat. Um, no, but let me let me finish because this video is starting to get a bit long. Um, the the story of Abraham in, in the Bible, where Abraham is summoned by God, he has this vision, and God orders him to kill his own son Isaac, whom he loves, and he's willing. He's going to kill Isaac, and he does it. He follows God. He suspends he suspends his faith to the destiny of like to the to the to the to the to, the, to God's willing, and God saves Isaac, and. It's a, it's a very contradictory idea that the highest level of freedom is to surrender yourself to to faith in a way to the to the revelation that faith offers. The night of faith, as Kierkegaard calls it, it's a very paradoxical idea, and it will be it would take a whole other video to explain it. She really wants to go outside. Hey, say hi to. You. All right, this is this is a existential cat right here. I'll be with you in a second. Let me just finish, please. Um, so, uh, and yeah, so this idea being that there are three different stages to uh, an individual's relationship with his, his or her own existence. An aesthetic mode of existence, uh, an ethical mode of existence, and a religious mode of existence. And the religious mode of existence is the, mo the mode of the night of faith. The aesthetic mode of existence is essentially you live to pursue your pleasures, your uh, interpretation of your life is in the moments, uh, social status matters, you don't really have an overarching framework according to, uh, a principled overarching framework according to which you live. And so for Kierkegaard, the least free man or the least free woman is the person who does not have this ethical framework, so is not yet at the ethical mode of existence, is someone who seems to th thinks that they utilize their freedom to pursue goals that have nothing to do with these frameworks but in the end they only try they only they don't realize that they satisfy their immediate desires um the ethical mode is is the mode in which someone is able to restrain that blind submission to to to, to desires of the moment in view of a higher ideal the thing is, what Kierkegaard says is that it's this ethical mode is a more free mode because you're responsible for your actions and you really have a power of judgment over what you do. But at the same time, who says that your your ethical framework is the right one? In the end, you're still choosing, you're still maybe allowing yourself to desire this ethical framework over another one. And so you're not completely free. And the fact of the matter is, there is no real framework except the transcendental framework that comes from the voice of God himself. And by completely and blindly, not blindly, but in full knowledge of uniting yourself with the universal will of God, that's where, where you attain the highest form of freedom. You just act according to faith itself. 
by completely subscribing to the voice of faith. The teleological suspension of the absurd, as, as Kierkegaard called it. Now, you might say that's counterintuitive. It's an eye insight. Um, and this is why it seems counterintuitive. It's not really arrived at by a rational argument. Kierkegaard reverses a Hegelian argument, but essentially arrives at the scheme, which, by the way, by dividing it between these different stages that the individual can attain, he he's utilizing a very great deal of TI as well. Uh, and finally, by saying there is this schema, you can attain it, right? You, there are different parts and you can move from one to the next until you reach like reunion with the universal from your individual standpoint by having faith and by exercising your faith, following a supposedly blind command that you cannot have any control over. Well, if you, if you are, if, if from an individual standpoint, you sort of accede to the universal standpoint, well, in a way, the individual that Kierkegaard is talking about is transcendent, is transcended by the universal. And therefore, every single individual that, can, that, read, that reads Kierkegaard's books has in front of him or her a template for relating to the universal. And so, rather than this superficial FI idea that it is the individual that is the start of everything, the highest form of the individual is union with the universal. FE over FI. Okay, that was my interpretation. I know it's probably gonna bound, it's probably bound to be a little bit controversial given that this issue uh, has so many features so many adherents to the view that uh, Kierkegaard is INFP. I, I, hoped, I hope that I have made a coherent argument, at least coherent one, that Kierkegaard is an INFJ and not an INFP. Let me know what you think in the comments, guys, and uh, like and subscribe. That would be very nice. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. Ciao, guys.